All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening on this first of our modern Orthodox Rabbanim leaders on the, on the front lines. So the goal of the course over the next few weeks is to really speak to the, a lot of the rabbinic and uh, rabbinic le leadership of Sydney, modern Orthodox leadership, and to focus on the challenges that we find specifically for the modern Orthodox community. So it's a great pleasure today to be sitting with Rabbi David Blackman, uh, a mentor and Rebbe of my own. I mean, Rabbi Blackman is there with me right at the beginning of my own uh, personal journey. Rabbi has uh, been in Sukkot since 1996, that's right, and uh, a, a Talmud of the Gush of Rav Aaron Lichtenstein Zal and Rav Ami Tal Zal, and uh, Rabbi Blackman's been running the JLC ever since. So Rabbi Blackman, just for my own personal history, when I, when Rabbi Blackman saw first met me, I was very much, uh, let's call it self-identifying as a more yeshiva shacharadi kind of guy. And within a not, a, not too uh, long amount of time, Rabbi Blackman sort of corrected my thinking. And the way he corrected my thinking was not by, by challenging me, but by just asking me good questions. Never coming to attack me or my beliefs, but just asking me questions. And those questions sort of set me on a path, which set me down the line of what I think we'll call modern orthodoxy for lack of a better term. But uh, so firstly, welcome, Rabbi. And thank, thank you for you. joining us. Thank you for everyone else for joining us. Um, let's start with the definitions. So how do you define modern orthodoxy so we can have a sort of framework with which we can start our discussion? Thank you, Rabbi Gad. A pleasure to be with everybody. Essentially, to answer Rabbi Gad's question about definitions of terms, it really is a challenge because if you go to America and you ask somebody about modern, modern orthodoxy, they have a very different definition to what we're working with. Essentially, what um, uh, I would put forward is, of course, one of the God puts us in a world where the world seems to communicate two messages to us. One track is that to be uh, holy servants of Akosh Baruch Hu and develop a spiritual relationship with Hashem on all levels. At the same time, the, world, the, the other half of the world is, is very much laden with all sorts of areas of uh, different chokhmah, different wisdom which uh, at first glance sits outside the brackets of, of, of Torah. Uh, and the, the question or the struggle is how to deal with that dichotomy. Does one think that the, the intelligence and the knowledge, uh, the value system uh, outside the so-called religious framework has what to contribute to the Jewish world um, and therefore you try and create a synthesis with it? Or does one think that one has to resist its influence um, you know, under all circumstances. So I guess a modern Orthodox person would look to say that Hashem created a situation where there's a struggle between a spiritual personality and a person who's living in a physical world. And the modern Orthodox person would try and take the orange or the fruit, which is um, divided into its peel and its fruit. And you would recognize that there are values that are totally outside of Torah and those have to be rejected. And they're values that are within Torah and can be used for Torah. And so the knowledge, the expertise, uh, uh, all, all embodied in science, biology, the, the fingerprint of Hashem in the physical world would be used for uh, the service of Torah as well. So it's that synthesis, which I think most modern Orthodox people that at least are sitting around us having this discussion, I think would, um, would find as a, an apt definition. resonated and, and this comes to I suppose a lot of different ways that people approach modern orthodoxy. So I gave him a drush on Friday night where I talked about the uh, the fact that the late Rob Twersky. Now I think if you were to look at Rob Twersky and you'd see a guy wearing a strimal and the the, the payers and a kapota, you would think this is an ultra orthodox Jew. But the fact is that the guy was what a world renowned psychiatrist. Now, for me, one of the things that really attracted me to modern orthodoxy wasn't so much the fact that it was embracing modernity as much as was, to use a bit of a more of a yeshiva term, so as to be sholet in Torah and to be sholet on whole, which means that there's, there's Torah 
And uh, one is has to be a, an absolute maven, a, a, someone who's very holding in the world of Torah, they understand the Torah. It's not just that the person is a, a professional and uh, once a week they have a shear for an hour. That wouldn't be my definition of modern orthodoxy. The person who feels that the world of Torah, they have to be completely holding in in all elements of it, but also the world of uh, secular knowledge. Now, whether secular knowledge be science, whether it be arts, whether it be humanities or, or, or commerce, the fact that the person is very much a person of the world. And I think if you look to our, our Rebbe Rav Luchtenstein, I mean, for me, Rav Luchtenstein, he's seen not only his, uh, the fact that he was a, a Talmud Chacham Atsum, but the fact that he had a PhD in literature from Harvard, and that every time he spoke, you heard the Harvard come out. And that for me was, you know, it wasn't the fact that Harvard is Harvard and stays in Harvard, and you should you should stay, you should somehow there was this unique lens of being able to bring the world of uh, modernity and combine with the world of Torah. So, I mean, I don't know if that dis I don't think it disagrees. I just think it's stage two. The actual philosophical underpinning is, is that you see value in that world. And therefore, you explore it, and then you bring it in to the service of Torah, um, or to support Torah, or to contrast with Torah. Then there's, I think there's value there. And it's true. I think Ravaran showed us that. Uh, yeah, it just brings a, a bit of complaint for the on the uh, audio, so I'm just going to bring this a little bit closer. My apologies, a little bit closer. There we go. Sorry, a little bit, a little bit more yeah. intimate. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, so sorry. I think that uh, I, don't, I don't think we're disagreeing. It's just a question of how you phrase it and what the stages are. I think why Bartuski was um, such a unique personality, and possibly if I would be so bold as to say why you have a, uh, a, a tremendous fascination and. and uh, respect for him is because uh, what he was doing is something unusual. You know, Hitaka was taking, you know, modern science, scientific um, explorations in the world of psychiatry, and he was using it for the better kind of betterment of, of mankind and Kalisra. And I think, yeah, that is a, that, that he expressed it. I wouldn't say he wouldn't want us to call him modern. Um, and, and, and this is really the part that I think we're going to get into where the word modern does it contradict, does it undermine uh, when you talk about um, modern orthodoxy? Because there's a kind of a tautology there. There's, a, you know, there's some sort of a contradiction that, uh, that, that, that at first glance you meet when you see these two terms come together. So, okay, so let's, let's, let's delve into that because I mean, I think when, when many people talk about this concept of modern orthodoxy, they focus a lot more on the modern than on the orthodox. So, and, and I think it's one of the great indictments on, for lack of a better term, our communities, is that people say, well, modern orthodoxy means that I have a TV and I like playing sports and I dress in a suit and a tie and I can go to the footy, but uh, I keep Shabbat or I keep uh, traditional Judaism, which I think is, is uh, not what I believe in. So, I mean, where, where, do, where are the greatest challenges you see in, 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 this, uh, in the modern community? Well, if you don't mind, maybe I can uh, share the view through my subjective lenses. Growing up in a, uh, a from home, and then having to deal with some of these challenges as, as I grew up and matured. Um, I grew up in a home where my, uh, my father's, uh, my, both my parents, but my father's influence in this area was, was, um, was, was, quite, was quite pronounced. From, uh, from my point of view, you grew up in a from home, and you you uh, you had from friends. Uh, it, was a, it was a pretty insular environment, which was absolutely gorgeous. From from a, from a kid growing up in an environment where the values that uh, you got from home were being reinforced in school, and uh, the community uh, picked up on that, and the entire um, you know infrastructure of Frumkart in Johannesburg was something that I, I was able to take advantage of. And so when you grow up and you go through stages of life, in the early years that I can remember, you know, th there, there was a difference in which shuls you dived in. Uh, but you were too young to really appreciate exactly what all of that meant. And so um, I would look at my parents and say to myself, okay, this type of Yiddish guy that they are working with, my father, both my parents, my father and my mother were, um, you know, very committed to your need, uh, Zionistically inclined, they'd gone through the ranks of B'nai Kiva, uh, but they were both privileged to have grown up from. So um, my, 
you know, my, my, my father's instruction wasn't something that I found contradictory to anything that I was learning at school. And even when I moved into a Haredi environment, Haredi high school, which I really had a most fantastic time. I never really had any regrets of going. Um, but the one area where it was difficult was that there was a challenge against Sionut. And that's the first part that I picked up where somebody was saying to me, why are you different? Or, you know, where is the difference between what you are doing and what your parents are doing and what your other from friends are doing? And in this area, modern orthodoxy is sort of like, it's, it's, I don't want to go off the topic so much, but I think in, in, in our discussion, we're going to see that there's a dovetailing. There's almost an assumption that if you're a modern Orthodox Jew, um, you have an affiliation to Zionism on some level. And, uh, but they are essentially two separate tracks. You can be very committed to uh, modernity being of value and not necessarily be a Tzioni in the same way. So, I mean, just interject that because for the, many people wouldn't be aware of the fact that you get things like Chardal, you know, Chardal is an acronym for Haredi Lumi, and this is referring to people who, um, for all intents and purposes, their lives are Haredi, even though they're Zionist. Sure. And so we, they're not modern Orthodox. They, okay. They're very different. So the, in Israel, they like to convert that the modern Orthodox is Dati Lumi. And Dati Lumi literally means religious Zionists. The religious Zionists and modern Orthodox like, are really not the same thing. No, they no, might overlap a lot. But overlap, yeah. yeah. That's the point I'm trying to make. There's a huge overlap. For, you know, um, even to go back to the, the genesis of, uh, of the challenge in modern Jewish history, you well know that the, the catalyst for the struggle um, in Jewish life was essentially what we refer to in history as the, the era of emancipation. Where all of a sudden, the non-Jewish world, specifically the area of academia, uh, became a possibility for Jews. And the minute you know the Jewish, the non-Jewish world opened up its its, uh, its, its doors to the Jewish uh, uh, intelligentsia, they um, they jumped at it. They jumped at the opportunity to get in there. And the biggest question that he, that emerged from that whole emancipation era is, you know, whether one was to uh, what kind of relationship do you, were you going to have with modernity? Were you going to resist it completely or as much as possible as we understand the Khatam Sofer and the, the Haredi society that developed it from there? Were you, or were you going to like, deal with it as a kind of a stranger on one level, but ne a necessary stranger? And it was only as good as it was, um, it was congruent with Yiddish Kaitla. And that, that was the first semblance where Rav Shem Hirsch and others along his lines, in my understanding, um, that they looked at modernity as as having a key to um, you know to to propel Am Israel's destiny to the next stage of uh, of its success and its contribution. And so, Rishon Shmuel Hirsch, why I bring him up is because he's another classic example on the other side of the spectrum that you mentioned, where he's I don't know if he would like us or his followers would like us to call him modern because they felt. The modern wasn't right, but what what you know his his uh, his conditional coexistence of the two um, led uh, led him to become the model the paradigm of what uh, using the modern world and seeing value in the modern world. At the same time, he was uh, completely not engaged in the Zionist process. He was anti-Zionist as such. He meaning in a sense that he didn't see that the future of Kali Israel uh, was there. That the future of Kal Israel, of being a Mensch Israel, of being an Orla Goyim, was in Europe. So, yes, there you have a, a, a major difference between, you know, modern orthodoxy and, and religious Zionism. But going back to the, the little comment that I was making, for me personally, it was one of the first, it was the first, um, it, was, it was the first area of discomfort that I felt or forced me to think about, you know, why were we different? You know, I was at this Haredi High School, all my friends were wonderful, never had any issues, uh, but there was this one area of very uncom it's a, uncomfortability where, you know, I was, I was Tsioni, was very Zionist due to my parents' upbringing and, and, and specifically my father's passion about Zionism. My mother was, was much more in love with the idea of Zionism. My father was really in love with Eretz Israel proper. You know, he, uh, he never managed to, to get there until the last uh, days of his life, but in principle, Every every second, every dvar Torah, every every emphasis that he put uh, that he that he 
that he brought to the table was always, uh, you know, it was it was infused with um, love of Israel. But so this was the question. The question was, you know, why was it so different? Why were my friends and their parents, or more the rabbim at school, why were they so anti tioni and my father was so pro tioni And that was the first time I saw, you know, a difference within the world of uh, ideology, Ashkava, and, you know, it, it, it pushed me to uh, enter into discussion and to form a view, um, you know, on this particular area. At the same time, Johannesburg from jury hadn't uh, gotten to where there were schools that were only what you'd call a cheder, where there was absolutely uh, minimal, minimal, minimal secular education um, because it was seen as a bitl Torah, a waste of time, and you weren't learning Torah. Uh, I didn't experience that. The schools in my day, they were almost like a, a Shimshon and Fahl Hirsch model. Torah and Derek Eretz. Uh, you went there, you were... 100% compliant with Frumkeit on all levels, but you got a secular education. So I never really saw that, that struggle between how much secular education means something or doesn't mean something. A person would resist or not resist. I never experienced that. I experienced that in discussion, maybe philosophical discussion, but not the Maisa. Practically, the high schools that were available to us in the Frum world all had their secular program. Every one of us got a, the equivalent of an ACC, a matric. And so, that aspect of modern orthodoxy, where the, the clash between the Yeshiva Shekharadi world, which would resist as much as possible secular education, uh, and what I experienced as a child, I didn't find the, 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 the swords crossed on that particular point at the time. It was much more when you left school. Now, all of a sudden, your choice was, you know, what was your path going to be? And 99% and of my friends were going to go to Yeshiva and remain in Yeshiva. And... You know, most of them were not going, are going to be interested in a in a secular degree, and so modern orthodoxy, uh, as the way I'm describing it to you, um, if I'm correct in portraying it this way, has two major forms of expression that I grew up with. One was it connected itself to religious Zionism, and number two, it espoused the view that secular education was of major value and it was worth exploring. And it wasn't just to get a job or a profession, but it was because there was chokma bagoyim ta'amin. There were there were unique gifts of, of intelligence, of knowledge that Hashem had given the secular world, and we could we could use it for many things. We could use it to prove Hashem's existence. We could use it to interact with people. We could use it to further Hashem's interest in the world. These were all parts and parcel of how uh, you know a secular education could be seen as having a certain value. So for me, those were the two fault lines where as a person growing up in a from world, those were the so-called two uh, questions that I was asked to answer uh, on, a, on an ideological level. What's your relationship towards Israel? Because as a modern Orthodox person, that was a major, a major area. And number two, it was, you know, what were you going to do? Why are you going to university? Is it important? Is it not important? I'm just going to try to do something. We, we having a, not having a fun time with the tech this evening. So I'm just gonna to try to do something slightly different. Hopefully this will work a bit better. Give me two seconds. Okay, hopefully that's gonna be a little bit better with the, with, the, with the sound and with the picture. So one of the things I know, you can't really see it behind you and behind Rabbi Blackman's um, back, you'll see two pictures over there. Now, uh, interestingly enough, I'll just put the video on a little bit to the side, so you can see of, on the, the one side is Rav, uh, Rav Cook, and the other side is Rav Soloveitchik. Now, I think one of the interesting things of uh, the two personalities is Rav Soloveitchik, I think for those of us, for those who are not familiar with Rav Soloveitchik, Rav Soloveitchik was, you know, one of the, uh, you know, the, the pillars of the uh, Soloveitchik, the brisk dynasty, who in many ways parted from his, uh, his family's, what we would call in modernity, what we call ultra-orthodoxy. He himself got a PhD in philosophy from Berlin University. He went to, to America, he was the Rosh Yeshiva in what became YU, Yeshiva at Rabbeinu Yitzhak al Khanan. And he became, you know, of the voice of the modern Orthodox world in America. Rav Cook, ironically, who is, and he would be often, many would say, if you've got any B'nai Kiva branch around the world, you say picture of Cook. 
But Rav Kook, you could not be more Haredi than Rav Kook. Rav Kook uh, was not, not modern Orthodox by any sense of the, the word. Rav Kook uh, embraced secular Zionism. Rav Kook embraced the State of Israel, uh, the, 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 the beginnings of what would become the State of Israel. But Rav Kook did not embrace university. Rav Kook was, you know, if he was alive today, when he was there, he'd be living in Meisharim, the neighborhood. He did not dress like a modern Jew in any sense of the word. And yet somehow we've got this interesting, you know, when we look to our forefathers of modernity and modern orthodoxy, somehow Rav Cook's name sort of comes in there, even though his life itself was like not in any way modern orthodox. So I, I don't know like how, yeah, you, see, you just got those two personalities behind you. And like, I wonder how you balance it, Rav Cook. Uh, just, uh, just, I, I just put a halakhic word in there. There was an interesting machloka between Rav Cook and Rav Soloveitchik. So this uh, was not getting into too much contra controversy over here. So in... Um, in Brit Mila, so there are three stages of Brit Mila. There's the cutting of the foreskin, there's Priya removing of the membrane, and the third stage called Mitzitza. So Mitzitza is when the, the Mohel will come and draw a bit of blood out of the wound. Now, the way that historically was always done is through the mouth. The, the Mohel would put his mouth on the wound and suck blood out. Over time, that has sort of fallen out of favor in the, in the majority of uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, the non Haredi world that is used through a syringe or something else. When it came to this particular topic, Rav Soloveitchik really embraced modern science and said, you know, Mitzitza was at the time of Chazal, this is what they thought was the, uh, this, this really was a, a danger if you did not do Mitzitza, but now we know that this is not the case. And not only do we not have to do Mitzitza, but if there's a bris on Shabbat, that do Mitzitza would actually come to break in Shabbat unnecessarily. So that's Rav Soloveitch, on one hand, embracing, you know, modernity. Rav Cook, on the other hand, was, was very adamant that you do Matsitsa, you do Matsitsa with your mouth because of the spiritual concern, the spiritual sakana that there is. So you have like a, a just a, it's a litmus guess that you have one who is embracing modernity and seeing that, I don't want to go as far to say that Chazal uh, were mistaken, but that certain revelations as a result of uh, modern uh, science uh, in, uh, discovery means that we need to reevaluate how we apply halakha in certain areas. And Rav Kook, who was much more of a traditionalist and say, no, this is what it is and this is what it was. So, yeah. Like, okay, so, yeah, so uh, we, we, this, this is not hard talk, but I'm happy for, for some pushback. So. Um, well, look, I'll just make one comment, um, you know, to, to, um, to take, to, to sort of like, I, I would say, color what you said before, that Rav Cook um, in no way was, um, an admirer of university. Um, I'll say like this, that um, Rav Cook had a major ambivalence towards the nature of setting up a university, but it was because the university of those days came with an ideology. So when people were against secular education, today it's sometimes hard for us to understand why, because all you're doing is you're going to, uh, you, you're getting, you, you're enrolling in a course and you, you're getting the bare bones education of the course. Yes, the university's pad the courses and you, you know, if you, whatever course you're doing, they want you to stay there longer and make it harder. So they put a whole bunch of stuff in there. But really, it doesn't have what it had in the old days. And that is that university or secular studies came with a philosophical track. Even if it wasn't explicit, it was implicit. You know, you, you were looking at secularizing the world. It was a rejection of religion if you were scientifically based. And that was one of the major areas of uncomfortability that people had in secular education. So um, I'll, just, I'll just share with you um, the following, that um, I could quickly jump up and get a chumash <laughs> too. <laughs> I'm itching to get a chumash, yeah. but uh, anyway, I'll just, I'll just say it over. But basically, um, Rav, Rav Cook, to the best of my understanding, understood that all endeavors, all areas of secular knowledge could be of benefit, could be of benefit if it was refined and used through um, the halachic process. And so when Rav Cook was asked to give a, a letter of approbation or a divrei bracha, a letter of blessing to, uh, you know, the art school of B'Tzalel, so he would do it, he, he, you know, and... Uh, this is one of the biggest clashes with the Haredi world is that he would give a brocha. So he himself wouldn't, wouldn't go in there to understand, you know, how painting works or, you know, the nature of the people who were doing it. But 
if this could be used to beautify the land of Israel and to create to create a field within the area of, of, of art, which makes Israel and whatever Yerushalayim stands for more beautiful, then we should invest in it. But he, he then writes to the people in Betzalel, but these are the rules. And then he tells you, you know, you can't start making statues like you want. You can't have pornography. You can't, you got to, you got the art has got to be governed by halacha. If it's not governed by halacha, then it's trace. So he accepted modernity and maybe, I wouldn't say embraced is the right word, but he, he respected what it could achieve for Kali Yisrael in Eretz Israel to further Am Yisrael's, you know, uh, standing in the area of Hadar, of, of, of beautification of Akush Baruch's world and Hashem's land. And, um, the big, the big struggle Rav Cook had was is that, is that people accused him of being naive because he would often uh, agree to go to the openings of universities and write them letters. He would make a condition that they would be fully compliant with halakha and they pull all over his eyes and, and, and do the exact opposite. And case in point is, is, is the establishment of the Hebrew University in 1925 where... Yeah, so he... So he uh, anyway... Everybody went. I think this is probably one of the, the straw that broke the camel's back between Rav Cook and the and the and the Shivisha world or the Haredi world was this opening of the university because the biggest issue, the thorn in everybody's side, was that university said we want to open up, but we want to have a uh, we, we want to basically have a department of biblical criticism. Now, biblical criticism does everything in its power to undermine the divinity of Torah. It's to secularize. It's to to to, it's to, to like take the Tanakh and, and, and look at it as you would a secular book. And there was no divinity there. It was to take the Neshoma out of the Tanakh. And it does it by chopping up the Tanakh with all its literary rules, and it comes up with a matzah pudding of notes. Anyway, so the Rav Cook basically made an agreement with the university that he would feature at the opening of the university and give his Divrei Bracha on one condition that they wouldn't open the Department of Biblical Criticism. And apparently the story goes that they agreed. You know, and the story goes that they agreed, but they violated the agreement. And so, but what, what to me, what was interesting is when Ruff Cook spoke at the opening of the of the university. Ruff Cook basically said as follows: He, he quoted from the Haftarah of Pasha Kitavo, where we find ourselves already, um, you know, hopping a skip just before Rosh Hashanah, and we've we've come out of the Tisha B'av already for for a month and a half, and we're now sitting where Akush Baruch was promising through the words of the Navi. He's promising Am Yisrael redemption. And the description of the Navi is that there will come a time where the, the wealth of the world will find its investment in the land of Israel. And all the great leaders will come to ask Israel for advice. And not only that, but the wisdom of the West or the wisdom of the world will be found in the land of Israel. This is a prediction in the Navi. You know, and Rav Cook saw this as a living proof of what was going to happen. This was his dream for the Hebrew University. The Hebrew University would attract the greatest minds in the Jewish world, you know, uh, in, a, in, in the academia of the Jewish world, and bring him and in a, in, in create this Kiddush Hashem, if you will. Now, people called him naive because who are you talking about? The secular people that, that want to undermine Yiddishka. Anyway, the, the beauty of Rav Kook's uh, uh, Kiddush, his novel idea, Kiddush is a novel idea that he shared at the opening was, he quoted from the Nabi from Haftarah there, of, 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 of Haftarah of Pasha Kitavo. And he said the following, he says, that Akash Baruch promises all these things, specifically that the wealth and the knowledge of the, of the world would come to Israel. And then the Nabi says, He says, you will be scared and your hearts will be opened. And Rav Kuka wanted to understand the inner contradiction between those those two words, you know, means you'll, you'll, your hearts will be opened in delight and in wonder as, as that, that, that Am Yisrael now is, is, a, is a leader in world academia. Um, so why would you have to be ufachad? Why would you have to be scared? So Rav, Rav Cook said, because he said, there are two tracks of knowledge that Am Yisrael is privy to. One track of knowledge is Torah. And, and, and that is going to, he, he blesses that Torah will come to Israel. It will become the center of Torah, Torah study and expertise and, and, and a Jewish way of life, which will happen through Eretz Israel building itself. And there, the opening of Yeshiva is we don't have to worry about. What we have to worry about is that when the secular world comes in, 
there we have to be very, very scared because it could go either way. And so, you know, he he uh, he wasn't anti, but he but he was he was skeptical, but positively skeptical. Mm-hmm. And so, just to you know, cut out what you were saying before, that in that way he had a unique opinion as to where secular knowledge could take us. But he was but he, he was in mourning when he when he found out that that pulled the wool over his eyes, that opened up the department. And, uh, you know, Israel is best with the world's biggest apikorosim, you know. The best heretics come from us, you know. Nobody can touch us in that area. So, and that's what happened. In fact, just to uh, fast forward many, many years, um, I found myself uh, sitting, um, you know, at a crossroads when I was at Yeshiva. And um, I, uh, my parents were pushing me to get a secular degree. You know, so you get a degree, you have to be employable, you have to get a degree, um, you need you need higher education. And I personally was against it. You know, I, I, what, I, I'm not into it, it's not my thing. I, I, you know, I'd much rather, much rather, you know, put my head into the Rambam than into, than into, you know, Descartes. You know what I mean? It's like not my thing. So I didn't see any value in it. And, you know, anyway, what, what can I do? My parents are arguing with me. There's a kind of a tension over here. And, um, you know, so how do you des- how do you resolve that tension? So I said, okay, let's go and ask Rabbi Lichtenstein. He's our Rebbe, he's our Rosh Hashiva. Let, let, let him tell us what to do. So the three of us, my, my mom, dad, and myself, we went into his office and we had a, a long chat with him. And, um, you know, I put over my points of view that I thought that, you know, it's really... You know, isn't it more of value? What, what's the value of it? What's the story? And so what Rav Lichtenstein did was said to me as follows. He said to me, what do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> so, so I said, I'm still working it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we're both still working that. Right you know, what, what are you going to do? So I said, I don't know. But I, you know, and, and, and straight away, my, my, my father interrupted. You know, he says, he doesn't know, but we all know that it's good for him to go into Chinuch, into education. I was told, I really didn't know. He said he should become a Rov. He should become an educationalist. You know, so then I looked and said to me, do you agree? I said, yeah, makes sense. Uh, you know, I feel, I feel a passion for teaching, etc. So he said to me, and to which audience are you going to talk to? Are you going to talk? Are you going to become a Rebbe in a Yeshiva high school? And you're going to teach Gemara all day? Or do you feel you have a passion for something else? And then I, I said to him, no, I think that tertiary education is where I'm, where, where, you know, what excites me. If I talk to educated adults, you know, and try, my, 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 my thrill is to always to take a complex problem and to show the majesty of Torah by packaging the problem and its solution as part of a Torah class. Um, and so... You, you need a certain amount of um, intelligence you know, that, that sits there naturally in the classroom or in the lecture room so that you can deal with this, this kind of issue. And so when I said that to him, he said, well, your entire audience is going to be secularly educated and therefore it won't be a good idea if you have not you know, educated yourself with the language through which you're going to educate. And so all of a sudden he turned me upside down on my head and, uh, and pushed me to go towards this. Uh, anyway, so I ended up doing a, I ended up doing a degree. But he, he comforted me in saying that I, I understand your dilemma. We've all had the dilemma. He says, and, uh, you know, to, to make sure that you are happy with what's going on in the degree, I, I, I offer my services to you. You normally come to me with Gemara Shilas, Aloha Shilas, ideology. If you get stuck on, on, a, on, a, on a text that's a philosophical text, uh, whatever, come, we'll, we'll talk it through. Why I mention this to you is because... Uh, the University of South Africa, UNISA, you know, it's not exactly Harvard, but all right. So, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, the UNISA curriculum came and um, I took the curriculum choice to him to say, okay, what should I study? So then I said to him, look, it says Judaica, it's the history, uh, his, Jewish history, Jewish philosophy, etc., Jewish literature. And then it had a component in Kabbalah, you know, so... You know, Professor Khrelem from UNISA was teaching me Kabbalah through this, uh, you know, through the, through, the, through the study guides of UNISA. So I, 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 I say, I, I've never studied Kabbalah before. So he looks at me and he says, let me have a look at the, 
that works the, the, the textbooks, the prescribed textbooks. Anyway, he looked at the prescribed textbooks and uh, the one prescribed, the main prescribed textbook was a textbook by the, by, written by Gershon Sholem. Gershon Sholem was a, an, an, you know, but was, a, was an intellect of note. He had come to Israel as part of that department, you know, and from a from card point of view, you know, it was a disaster. Anyway, so I've looked at him, looked at me, he said to me, you can't study that textbook. I said, why? He says, well, read the introduction and then you'll see. So I did, I read the introduction and in the second page already, he says, well, the Ariza, the Holy Ari, Lurianic Kabbalah, you know, this is his opinion and I don't like it, this is my opinion. So the minute you see somebody, you know, throwing out the master of Kabbalah in Jewish tradition in one sentence, you know, you're on for a different ride here, you know? And this is what he was saying to me. So now, but now I'm in trouble. But I've enrolled in the course. The main prescribed textbook is this Gershon Sholem thing, right? And uh, I've even got the textbook, you know? And, and, and this is the exam is on this book. So how am I going to study for the course? So anyway, at that point, at that point, also I said to him, how many other people aren't you allowed to read? He says, well, whenever you have a textbook, come talk to me, I'll tell you. You know, he's probably read them and he, and he, and he knows. So over the years, there were certain authors where everyone said, don't read it. Don't read it. The ideas are traits. And this was one of them. And he sent, he sent me to our, co our founding Rosh Hashiva, Rav Amital Zatzal. And he said, Rav Amital has unbelievable knowledge of Kabbalah. He will look at the table of contents and he will match it up for you in the original sources that you have in, in the in, in, you know, in proper Torah sources. And then you'll be able to answer all the questions left and right. <laughs> that was my experience about, you know, encountering somebody who did embrace modernity, but at the same time was, was so clued up as to what was going on. He could tell you, this is dangerous, this is trafe, this is kosher. I mean, it's interesting when I, when, uh, an interesting anecdote. So uh, you, can't, you can't bring proofs from um, anecdotal anecdotes, but so one of the things that I always was marveled by Rav Luchtenstein is that, Rav Lichtenstein, not in Yeshua Kladi, but in every, virtually every article and uh, any public lecture you gave would always start off with a, a poem from Robert Frost or Mills, or, and it was, it was beautiful. And the way that Rav Lichtenstein really used his academic background to fault into the Torah, and you saw that in Rav Soloveitchik as well. Rav Soloveitchik's philosophy, if you read through his articles, whether it be The Lonely Man of Faith or Catharsis or Halachic Man, you just see his secular knowledge and his Torah knowledge, you know, combined. Now, there's another world of, of let's, I, I don't know if you call it modern orthodoxy, but a world that accepts the necessity of secular education, but as a, as a necessary evil, rather than as, a, as something of value. So whereas I'd like to think that Rav Lichtenstein saw value in the city. It wasn't, you didn't study to get a job. You studied because there was value in, in reading these things, and, and Rav Slavik to say. So one of Rav Lichtenstein's Talmudim, Rav Michal Rosenzweig, he was one of the Rosh Hashivas in uh, Yeshiva University. So he's also got a PhD in English literature. And so when I was in YU a few years ago, I went to go to some of his shirim and the like. And I was speaking to one of the, the students in the shirim. And, and they expressed to me that Rav Rosenzweig never quotes secular literature. And I said, like, why? And they said, because his philosophy is that if you can teach an idea through Torah, why would you study it by bringing secular literature in? And it was just such a, a different way of looking at it because for me, the, the beauty of reading, you know, something by Rav Lichtenstein, Rav Soloveitchik, or anyone who does something like it. And in my, in, in my experience, I haven't found anyone who does it as, as well as, as Rav Lichtenstein, Rav Soloveitchik. But this, this other world, and I, I would like to I think, unfortunately, that th that model is very few and far between. Now you have one of two people. You have the people who are academics who know a lot of Torah and uh, the academia sort of shines much more or the opposite Torah scholars who may be very academically accomplished, but you never know it because Torah is Torah and it's like Kodesh and Chol never mix. And I think that's what we find now happening in the modern Orthodox world is that whereas maybe it wasn't as common as I'd like to think it was, but where modern Orthodox could be, could Mishtalev, could somehow combine into this unique, Thing which allowed you to somehow balance, use the brilliance of, of science and Torah and bring them together. That all your science is Torah and all your Torah is science or, or whatever. But now it's much more that people have chosen. So they're either moving, say, to the right, that even if you study, 
it's just, you know, it's something you have to do. And, or you, the other than that, your Torahs, you know, the Torah and science don't really mix. And, and, and I, I struggle with that. I struggle with that. I find that it's too difficult for people to combine the two disciplines. And that's for we see the happening now. I think on a different degree, if you look at traditional jury, what's happening now. So those of us who grew up in families who were not observant, but would do lots of Jewish stuff, they'll go to Shul in front of the descendants are doing one of two things, either leaving Yiddishkeit to as much greater degree, or they're embracing Yiddishkeit to a much greater degree. And I think modern orthodoxy, in its purest sense, is struggling with the same uh, same struggle. Yeah, I would agree. I would, I would amplify it um, a lot more. I, was, I would say that, look, let, let's, be, let's be candid here. Up until now, we've sort of like celebrated what modern orthodoxy or religious Zionism, uh, you know, has achieved. Um, and, and the ability to be able to see the establishment of the state of Israel as the greatest miracle in 2000 years and to, you know, to bask in its glorious achievements uh, on a scientific and military, on a societal level. There, there's, so much, there's so much beauty there to celebrate. At the same time, one, one has to be candidly honest that there's a, you know, there's a dark side as well. And, and the, the criticism against modern orthodoxy or many of the adherents of modern orthodoxy um, you know, was not, it didn't take too long in coming. In other words, you could start to see the following, that could the average person do what the greatest minds of our hashkafa, uh, our ideology are trying to do? You talk about Rav Lichtenstein and Rav Soloveitchik, uh, you know, our contemporary audience will probably be more familiar with, you know, Rav Jonathan Sachs. These, these are ambassadors of, of this story. Um, I would just make one comment to you about when you throw Rav Soloveitchik in with Rav Lichtenstein, you know, my personal experience is that, you know, Rav Soloveitchik has, with, with every bit of his um, secular knowledge, which was vast, right, there, there, is a, there was a demarcation. Rav Soloveitchik never quoted secular authorities or secular ideas um, in, in a shiur on a Gemara. You know, you, you listen to the shiurim, you read the shiurim, it's pure Torah. In fact, I, I remember once speaking to Rabbi Beryl Wan, Hashem uh, Yarechi Amav, you should live and be well, uh, in, in Yerushalayim, and um, we were talking about this. And he told me the following. He told me that as president of the OU, he had a lot to do with Rasulavechik for those years. And, uh, you know, he, he, he once discussed a little bit with him, and he heard him make the following comment. He said, you know, I'll take all of the philosophers and all of the mathematicians from the secular world, and it doesn't give me one geschmack is a beautiful choice. You know, in other words, you know, Ravaro, you never, you never heard him say that. Even though you felt that the shiur, and I was, I was in the shiur for six, seven years, um, you know, he, he, he would never make that kind of a statement, you know, but he would, he would punctuate, he would color, it would give it depth and charisma, you know, the secular knowledge, uh, as opposed to, you know, as something to contrast and compare. Uh, he was unique in that regard. I think Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was, it was very similar. Um, so, so again, how to use it? But going back to my original point, he has the problem. You've got these great intellects, but we not them. So when you say to me, look, you've got a limited amount of time, you've got to learn. You want to learn Torah. So you can either learn the real McCoy Torah, or you or you can go and you know, you can go and pats go on the side and try and get some enlightened, broaden your horizons a bit. Now how much am I going to gain and how fast am I going to be able to get through the literature, which is, you know, there's a lot of trace out there. It's not like there's just all glorious stuff. There's a lot of trace in that literature. So the question is, how do you filter it? How do you get, how do you master it? So for a guy like myself, who says, to me, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that on, on, a, on a massive level. So if I can't do it and master it, I'm not going to become a scientist, a mathematician, a philosopher, all at the same time like you could do in the old days. Yeah, I mean, everything is specialized today. So, so how much am I really going to get from, that, 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 modern, from that, that modern world? You know, just to quote a case in point, at one stage, uh, my good friend and colleague, Rabbi Lewin, Rabbi Paul Lewin, Paul and I went to Shiva together. So we had a we thought, okay, you know, we've got a little scene as our, as our model. Let's go and ask him for advice. What should we read? To broaden our, you know, our horizons in English literature, what should we read? Anyway, I think that when we approached him and asked him the question, you know, he sort of gave us this look like, 
are you wasting my time, boys? Or are you just trying to, what are you trying to play games here? What, you know? So he, he sort of like, he, he sort of fobbed us off. He basically said, um, look, you want to know where to start? He says, when you finish Shakespeare and Milton, come back and talk to me. Now, seriously, how long is it going to take me to reach Shakespeare? How long is it going to take Milton? How long is it going to take me? So, you know, I had a little bit of chutzpah in those days. Um, and I went back to him and I said to him, really? Just give me the first starting point. Where, you know, where am I starting? The first, just said to me, you know, Milton's Paradise Lost. You know, that, go read it. Come back and talk to me about it, you know? Um, th there wasn't another Rosh Hashiva in, in Eretz Israel, you know, maybe Rabbi Rabinovich, uh, nothing, right? M maybe. I don't believe there was another Rosh Hashiva in, the, in all of Eretz Israel that actually would take time to, to tell you which secular books to read. It was just, you know, unique. And in the, but, but my problem was, I recognized straight away that I couldn't become this ideal modern Orthodox person, you know, because it was, my intellect isn't broad enough and great enough to be able to move through this, to retain all of it, and then to be able to use it, I'd rather go to the, to the original. So you end up trying to work out how are you going to become like this? And then maybe I'm lucky enough to be um, able to filter all the information through a Torah prism to see what's kosher, what's trafe. But is the average person able to do that? And you start to see that for the geniuses among us, maybe there's a have in there, maybe there's a possibility they can achieve it. But for, for the average Joe, you know, how do you achieve that? So, you know, I learn as much as I can, but every now and then there are certain subjects that you know that you don't know where to find the Torah expression of these ideas. And so, you know, you, you need somebody else to help you find where it is. I mean, people today, you know, pay people online to, you know, to summarize all the books in the world that are ever written so that you can just summarize an academic book in five minutes. And so a person can say, oh, I read it. You know, is, is that really where, where it's holding? So, but at the same time, I would never have, I would never have been a person who reads um, secular, I don't, I don't, literature for literature's sake never really turned me on, to be honest with you. So Aaron was very poetic in this regard. I, I wasn't, I, you know, me, to me, history was something that I, that I really loved. So most of the stuff that I read is history. And then there's a bit of philosophy um, and sociology, you know, so next, you know, next to my bed, I would see value in reading, you know, Malcolm Gladwell. You know, I'm not going to take his shut, his explanation on David and Goliath seriously, but 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 what he uses David and Goliath for is phenomenal, and that I wouldn't have got out of Torah if I wouldn't have read because I'm not good enough to get that honey out of the hive of Torah. So someone's going to say to me, "Hey, I have you read this book? It's unbelievable. You'll like it." Or you start to see it yourself. You know, you're traveling. You see in the airport. What can I read? You know, I need a bit of a break. I need a, bit of a breather. I want to expand. So you'll 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 look at these things. You know, so. You know, to me, this is, this is where, you know, to read a lot when I, when I can, when I need a break on certain subjects, you know, that's what I still do to this, to this day. But, um, and I think that came from Rabbi Klinsen's influence. But having said that, you know, if you read a book, which is a waste of time, someone says, read this book, and you read it, and it either doesn't resonate with you, or it's a waste of time. So what's happened? You've gone in to explore a book, you know, spent a month really trying to read it, gotten nowhere with that book. So now you've wasted a month. Well, you can't waste a month reading a number. Second, second level. And this is where it becomes really controversial. But the second level is, is that modernity, modernity, the way we experience it today, and probably modernity has got a large, uh, the larger component of trade. And, and the influence it has on a person's personality is severe. Going back to my childhood. So... I knew we were different in this area of Zionism, you know. Again, the secular, secular education didn't really come up until after I left school. But in between, when I was in high school, you know, primary school to high school, something happened which was uh, quite profound. And that is that, I'm sure most of you will remember ex Africans, but TV came along. So I can still remember when we didn't have a TV. We never had a TV, it just wasn't there. Right? So, and then all of a sudden, you know, You've got Bulldog and Potrash, you know what I'm saying? And like, and so now you got now you had a question, you know, who, are you allowed to have a TV? And that was the other first, the, the other or the second argument that I sort of saw happening, you know, in the school, the Yeshiva school that I was at. Did you have a TV? Didn't you have a TV? 
Now, TV wasn't just about secular education. TV wasn't a history textbook, not, not the TV that we were getting. Or maybe in, you know, in America it was, you know, maybe it was educational, but you know, you know, but Vili Vili Vali wasn't, a, you know, you know, it wasn't, you know, it was just very, very nice, but it wasn't. So, so the question was, you know, what do you do? And, and the yeshivish world was saying to you, be careful. You don't appreciate the danger that TV has. But you bring it right into your living room. Most of it is trafe. At the very best, it's a waste of time. At the worst, it's got, you know, it'll degrade your language, right? It'll expose you to themes that are not appropriate. Your, your levels of modesty, your, 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 your finesse of speech will all degenerate. And it'll waste hours of your time. And, and that's, what, that's what the Yeshivisha world warned the modern Orthodox world, world about. And the modern Orthodox world, in my humble opinion, ignored this at, the, at our peril. And it allowed TV and movies to become a legitimate source of, of information, of entertainment. And, we, you know, I, I think we paid the price. Now, you know, this, this is part of, part of the problem. The problem is, is that no one can tell us today that, okay, TV is one thing, but what we've experienced with our children, you know, no one can tell us today that the internet and the iPhone, the iPads, and every other social media device, you know, does not have a price to pay. You know, how much time are we spending on this nourish card, on the nonsense? It's absolutely nonsense. And forget the, the bad stuff that comes from it. Now, don't get me wrong. I think you'll appreciate this uh, uh, as well. And that is that if the internet, from a modern orthodox approach, if the internet was invented or allowed to, to pervade our society like it has, a modern orthodox thinker will say, Hashem wants it here for a good reason. What, what can we do to use it, you know, to further the interests of Hashem in the world? You know, the, the Haredi world will say, don't even talk to me on that level. It's too dangerous to even contemplate. You know, so there will be different attitudes. So being coming from the more centrist orthodox or modern orthodox approach, one would say that there's obviously a reason for this. Thing. And it's, it's going to spread Torah around the globe. But more than that, just by example, those people who had access to internet and used it had a different approach to the pandemic. I don't know if you'd agree with me on that. They have a very different approach to the pandemic. They see the information, they read it firsthand. It's live feeds. You know, you, you seeing diagrams, you seeing pictures, you seeing video clips of people all over the world collapsing in a heap, you know, and you're seeing it live. You know, you... And, and, and if, you don't, if you don't have access to it, you're still trying to work out if there's a pandemic. So by the time somebody who doesn't have access to the internet wakes up and works out, what man, there's like, you know, the, 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 the world's on fire. You know, you've, you've lost thousands of people. And then your approach to it is going to be different. Now, I'm not here to bash, um, you know, people who don't have it, but what you see is that, that, that our approach or the centrist orthodox approach would look much more at it as, Hashem invented this tool for us. At the same time, how can you not see the danger? In it? And modern orthodoxy struggles with this. You know, it's much easier to say don't have it, but 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 the world can't work with it without it. So you really have to work with with this with this particular struggle, and it represents the struggle on every single level. So what I'm saying to you is, is that the embracing of modern technology and of and of modern values through the social media platform is very dangerous and I believe modern orthodoxy you know ignores the danger much more than it should and and and, and therefore you know it doesn't realize what it's doing to our children and to ourselves so in the old days when you're trying to work out which book should I read you know should I read uh, the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis or should I read uh, you know should I read Rabbeinu Bachai on the parasha so you could have an argument but at least C.S. Lewis was writing Seichel you know, I mean, he was writing stuff that's intelligent. That's that's you know, and 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 and. Uh, but now, I mean, like you know, now you're arguing. You can see hours upon hours upon hours of, and, and this is at the best, Vital Torah. Everybody's just like tuning into this thing. You're wasting your time. You're getting no grounding points. Exactly the opposite. You're eroding the sanctity of the Jewish family. You know, th this is to me what's ha what's happening. I, I want to maybe uh, take a bit more of a 
I think one of the things we, we would agree on is that the, the, the biggest challenge to those who call themselves modern Orthodox is what we would call Parav Yiddishkeit. Parav Yiddishkeit is a uh, form over content, meaning that uh, a modern Orthodox person, he does what he needs to do, but it's, it's almost hollow action. So they might even attend the uh, Shachat every day, and they might even learn, maybe even learn for many hours a day, but it's just externals. There's not, there's no, it, they don't feel it. And I think that uh, Halavai, that they're all learning about, there's a lot of Parav Yiddishkeit over there. But to maybe have a slightly softer approach in that we, to, to give a certain intellectual integrity to our Balabati, meaning that we accept the fact that we don't live in a world where the rabbis, you know, on top of the pyramid and telling people what is permissible, what's prohibited, what, what books are going to be censor, censored and what are not, and, you know, the like. But to have a sort of model of thinking, so there, there are two ways of looking at, call it entertainment, literature, and the like. Is one can look at them as, as a potential means to an end, meaning there's a, the Malcolm Gladwell book. So am I going to read it because it's an escape and it's just, it's fun, it's entertaining. And maybe there's place for that, but to be able to relax and have leisure time is also a means to an end. It's to recuperate in order to be able to function. You need to sleep in order to function. You need to eat to be able to function. But as soon as, when, as, soon as eating becomes an end in of itself or sleeping becomes an end in of itself, it's a problem. But even if we are doing whatever it is, even if you're watching Netflix shows, and, uh, and, but you're looking at it and say, what piece of wisdom can I pull out of this? Now, should I, is this better than Gomorrah? No one's saying that for a second. But we, we're living in a world that the vast majority of the people that uh, you are coming home from work at the end of the day are not really going to have time to learn or have the headspace or the desire to learn. But to be able to have that mindset that whatever they do, whatever show they watch, whatever book they read, whatever article, they are trying to piece out the wisdom that they can apply in the Avodat Hashem. In the service of a ship. It won't be as refined as the Godolin, but we're not the Godolin. But it's a perspective that you can look at this that the reason I'm picking show A or book A over book B is because I believe that there's a toilet, there's some benefit that I'll be able to get from that that will help me in, a, in my particular, you know, my service of a ship. I think it's naive. I mean, I think what I'm saying is naive because, you know, who am I to say that, you know, so let me get this right. You can, you can learn Gomorrah, but you're actually going to go watch a Netflix show and you're going to somehow justify, rationalize yourself that it's permissible. I get that. But I think there is a model that we, that we are trying to find the wisdom in the world wherever it lies. So I'd like to, now we are, we are getting close to the end of this, but there's, there's one last question that I want to ask, because this is something which I, I, I think for the modern world is a huge problem. And so if you recall, there was a number of years ago, there was a, a basketball player in the Israeli top league yeah. who was, it was a from guy. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, know his name, but it was, it was a from guy. He played with the Kippa and Sitsits yeah. and the like. In America? No, no, he played in, 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 Israel. in the Israeli, but you know, from guys playing top level basketball. Oh, but you could use that. You could use that. You could use a business, whatever yeah. the case may be. And someone came to me, it was actually a, a, a rabbi, and said, what a kid is Shashem. The guy, he's playing top-level sports, and he does it with a kippah and sits it on what's a Kiddush Hashem. For those who are not familiar with the Kiddush Hashem, a Kiddush Hashem is the idea of that it's a sanctification of Hashem that people say, I think that, wow, you know, that is, uh, that is amazing. I think that's how people understand. So I said to the, I said, I don't think that's, that a from person who succeeds in any area of life. So if you have a from guy who becomes a top uh, top actor, top singer, top athlete, that in of itself is not a Kiddush Hashem. And saying that that in of itself is a Kiddush Hashem is the opposite. Because what you're saying, if you say, because he's from and a professional sportsman, it's a Kiddush Hashem. It's saying that despite all the handicaps of being from, he's managed to succeed. Despite everything Hashem threw at him, somehow this guy managed to get through it all and succeed. If anything, you're saying the Torah is, Torah is supposed to set you up to fail and this guy's be able to overcome. Now, if the guy, when he plays professional sport, is able to use it as a means to be in Mekale Shem Shemai, that he, that, he, he, that he teaches and, he, and he's more of a mensch on the court, and he says, the reason, I, the reason I play the way I play is because of Torah, because of uh, Hashem, then it could be a Kiddush Hashem. But success and being from do not in any way automatically assume that that becomes a Kiddush Hashem.
So seeing the success, of, and it would be fair to say that modern Orthodox, because they embrace modernity, you are more likely to see a modern Orthodox person who's a celebrity or famous or successful than you will someone who's more ultra-Orthodox. But that gives him a greater responsibility to attribute that success to Torah, to Judaism, and to Torah. I don't know what we do. Agree, disagree. And I think it's quite complex. I mean, I think in today's day and age, you'll start to see that your your guest speaker is a fantastic example of that. What was her name again? I, I, Deutsch. Deutsch. Uh, BD Deutsch. Yeah. So she was from the Haredi world, became a marathon runner. So I, I just think that it's it's a complex discussion because the question is, what could you have done instead? You know, what would you be doing instead of playing basketball? At least basketball, you're playing, it's almost like there's something, it's almost neutral in the sense that you're not doing something bad. And if you've got a if, if there is such a thing in, in, in the world of philosophy as a neutral platform. So yeah, you have a neutral platform, which um, is, and that platform is, is giving you an opportunity to, like you said before, mm -hmm. become a spokesperson, you know, to be somebody that people will look at. And as a result, you've got an opportunity to, um, you know, to, to influence. There is that, you know, I think I, I, we get a lot of nachas out of watching sports, sportsmen and women, you know, show show the ethical soft side, you know, their side of humanity, you know. You, you, we used to, when I was growing up, you know, you used to compare, you know, Bjorn Borg to, to McEnroe, you know what I mean? Like, you, you could definitely compare these kind of, you know, who was the mensch, you know, who was the mensch and, you know, and, 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 and you know, who, who, who was the Bill Bechaya, you know, it's like that kind of a story. Uh, and again, it's like, so people have an opportunity in the world to show their humanity and if you can even call it spirituality, the causes that they support through through sport, which could be a could be a, a lot better than what what they would do in an academic environment if they were totally average. But but I think it's trying to work out what you know what you could do. What's your ideal from a Yiddish card point of view? You know I think you can see that that of course Baruch Hu has a different, um, a much more noble, tough kid for for a Yid than than uh, than, than you know becoming a, a great sportsman. In other words. White men can't jump. You know, mm -hmm. you know, Jews don't play sport in the end of the day. At some point in time, we're all going to learn that. Why? Because we aren't wired for that. We're wired to be able to further Hashem's interest in the world and, you know, hitting the, the ball 185 kilometers over the net. He's not exactly doing that. It might lead to that. I mean, you know, we, you know, you look at Ash Barty and you say, she's a man. She's an amazing ambassador for, 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 for good world, good ethics, for, for everything. It's, it's fantastic, right? But, but, but is that what a Yid should do? Is that, is that what the Manushoma, is that what I should be doing? Or maybe that's, you know, that, that's what the other people in the world should be doing. But I think that, you know, just, you know, the conversation um, is, has to stop at this point. But I do think that going back, another point is that, you know, there's a big discussion that has to be, maybe that should have been our, our biggest part of the discussion is this power of kind that you, you, you spoke about. You know, this is the, this is the saddest issue that, that basically, you know, modern orthodoxy, at least the way we see it in Sydney, probably in Melbourne is the same. And that is that, you know, it's, it's lost its passion for Yiddish guy. So, you know, you know, ask yourself the following question. You come back on a Motsa Shabbos, you know, what's your kid going to do? Is he going to go to see Spider-Man 16 or is he going to go and pull out a rumbab or write down a board he heard in Shul? You know, the minute you're going to say, I'm, gonna, I'm going to the movies to, to waste my time, even though he needs a break, right? I mean, our kids, their whole life is one big break. You know, so what I'm saying is, is that, is that it's, they don't even think that, that this is a, that's a problem anymore. So I think that a, a lot of us and our society totally, you know, just has lost this passion for Yiddish guy, the passion for, 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 for Torah learning and, and, you know, the commitment to being uh, exact within the world of keeping mitzvot in the, in the, in the areas of tzniyot, of modesty, in the areas of fine speech, good behavior, menshlecha, derech eretz, kibur avayim, all these values which are so central, I think that our exposure to modernity has smashed it. And uh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong to be that harsh on it, but I, I, do, I do believe there's a major issue there. Well, Rabbi Blackman, thank you so much. If there are any questions, um, please uh, type in the message in the chat below. And I uh, would love to uh, questions for Rabbi Blackman or for myself, but it's really been, uh, it's always wonderful to have a chat. Uh, sure, you yeah. know, it's been too long in us having a chat in public, but. Uh, so I have a question from Philip. Um, let's see if we can let's see if do you want to type it or fall? Let me see. If I can. No, I'll, me I'll ask six. it. I'm just going to find you and and okay, yeah, full go for it. Can you hear me? 
Can, can you hear me? You, okay, I can't hear you. Oh, hold on. Give me two secs. Try again. Can you hear me now? Uh, so my, it's my, uh, I'm just going to, yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay, so I'm um, so the one thing that hasn't been discussed really, which just surprises me, is the role of women. Um, and I'm a father of a seven-year-old daughter, and she's constantly, you know, asking me a question about um, the absence of women in shul and religious public observance. So, you know, the world has changed significantly since the 1970s. You know, we've had the success of feminism, the rise of the gay rights movement. And the way I see it is that orthodoxy has, I suppose, with mixed success, tried by and large to insulate itself from such evolutions. So the way I see it is that the change in the woman's status in the secular world is a monumental and permanent shift, which is yet to be reflected in modern orthodox life in observance. How do you think modern orthodoxy bridges the gap? How do I explain to my daughter? Okay, so I'm going to answer that in, 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 in a slightly deflective way, is that these are topics that we have coming in the upcoming weeks. We have uh, Rabbinit Judith Leverton, who will be talking specifically on the women's, of women's issues. Uh, Judith is uh, the first woman to uh, uh, obtain um, an orthodox smicha. I'm just be, you know, I'm being very uh, cautious in my term of them, an orthodox smicha in Sydney. And she's going to deal with uh, specifically that topic. Um, in the question of the LGBT community like we have uh, Rabbi Ben Elton and myself will be discussing that next week. So there's no question. These are big questions that uh, modern orthodoxy has to address. We cannot ignore them. And uh, that's why we have specific topics. So today, this evening was really the purpose of just going on the broad, the broad strokes of modern orthodoxy, whereas uh, in the upcoming weeks, we'll go much more in specific. So if you haven't received the flyer, just take a seat in the next, we've got four more weeks after this that we'll be dealing with Israel, um, embracing communities of difference, women's issues, and outreach. So those are the topics that we will be dealing with. So apologies we didn't deal with it tonight, but uh, in more intensity upcoming. Um, any other questions before we sign off for this evening? Oh, here we have uh, one moment. Okay. Where's the line when it comes to exposure of the modern world and influences in education, both in home and school? How much exposure should be introduced with with age and if so, to shelter until then. Well, I asked this question just so. With, so when I was once um, catching a, a hitchhike with uh, Rav, uh, Rav Chaim Brovinder, and uh, my chavruta and I we used to get a lift back to Jerusalem with him. And the hour before we, we got the lift, we'd sit and we would ask, what are we going to ask Rav Brovinder in the car, you know, to figure out. So Rav Brovinder is also one of the... Uh, big exponents of modern orthodoxy. Um, he's been in Israel for the last probably 40, 50 years. Um, and we, we wondered how we're going to do this. So we got in the car and I said to uh, Rav Bravinder, what does the Rosh Yeshiva think about exposing our children? You know, should we expose him to secular Jews and secular education or should we be more insular? And he looked at me and he said, I'm all for insularity. And then put his headphones in and I didn't speak to him for the rest of the trial. That was... <laughs> That was how it went to the Rav Ravinda. And if anyone knows Rav Ravinda, that's, that's true to form. Um, questions of degree, I think it would be fair to say is there are no answers. It's, it's, it's that balancing act of where does one insula, insulate their children and protect them from the external influences? And when does one expose them? Because by insulating them, you're doing them a disservice for when they do finally become exposed. I don't have any, I think it's, it's something that needs to be in consultation with Rabbanim, and, and professionals in this particular area, but I'm not sure there's a there's a particular formula. So, Rob Blackman, you... I, I would say that the the application that, that that I would use is if I can if I can put the value across to my children, um, you know, through classic Torah sources and uh, by use of of, of possible secular knowledge, be able to package it in a way that's palatable to them, then I would do that as long as I could. When, when it becomes a, when, when the value is exposed and the, the value is being taught through the street and my kids are picking it up there, then I need to, I need to understand where they're going, where they're getting it from, what it's all, what it's all about. But my, my first, my first port of call is, you know, we, we haven't, we have an unbelievable traditional value system. Um, and if I can 
if I can use it and put it across, you know, whatever influence I can give my kids that come straight out of uh, the classic Torah sources, you know, I, I would work with it. And, you know, the type of exposure, especially when they're younger, you know, I would, I don't believe is, is you know, is lacking in a, in a kid's personality, you know, when they are insulated from, uh, you know, from, from the outside world. There's some fantastic kids' books and you start to mix um, only because they can get the message across really well. But, you know, it's only when they start to mature and all of a sudden the knowledge base they're getting is not from you. It's not around the Shabbos table. It's, it's, it's what's on the street. It's what's at school in the program. It's, it's what's coming through the, the devices that they're watching. Then all of a sudden you've got to be really, really careful. And, um, and you've, got to re, you know, you've got to take note of what, of what level of exposure is happening there. That's just a, a, you know, a way that I've tried to, to work with it. Any other questions? Anyone going, 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 and gone. Well, Rabbi Blackman, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It's been fantastic attendance. It's wonderful. Uh, please, God, you should join us all again next week. I um, hope you have a Shavuot Tov and all the best.